If you were to search the Pacific War, you'd see all sorts of results recounting the epics of Midway, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, and the Manhattan Project. If you were to add the phrase home front to that search, you'd find all sorts about Japanese Americans experience in concentration camps. And if you narrowed the search even further to the Japanese home front, you perhaps find clips from the movie Unbroken and get a glimpse into American soldiers experiences in Japan. But what was life actually like for the Japanese living in Imperial Japan during the war? For an essential part of the world's biggest ever war, there's astonishingly little coverage in popular media about this very topic. So today we're going to cover this exact issue. What were the political, social and economic experiences of Japanese citizens during the war? Let's get into it. Hello there. Okay, so if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss our History of Modern China series and our Enemies of the West series, which come out on Saturdays. It's free to do. So firstly, we'll tackle the political components of the Japanese home front. And one of the main messages that the Japanese government put out to the public was the idea of spiritual mobilization. In the same way that an army had to mobilize for a war, the Japanese public had to mobilize their spirits to devote their lives to the war effort. One of the main reasons for attacking Pearl Harbor was the belief that Americans were individualistic hedonists who didn't have the gumption to stick out a war and would therefore surrender early in the war before they could mobilize their industry to turn the tide. So the Japanese government wanted to rid any notion of individualism within Japan. And so in September 1940, when Japan expanded into Indochina but were yet to attack Pearl Harbor, the nation's political parties were merged to form the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. Basically, this stopped anti-militarists from having the unity that a party brings, and it fractured organized voting blocks. The more militaristic politicians could therefore dominate the parliament and had free reign in advocating for all sorts of expansionist policies. And as with any country during wartime, the Japanese propaganda model was strong. The 1938 Mobilization Act laid down strong regulations in regard to news. Newspaper editors had to receive permission from the Home Ministry before publication, the government, who had control of the paper supply, refused to supply non-compliant newspapers with paper, and non-compliant journalists who still refused to comply with regulations were jailed or conscripted into the military. So by the time Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, most of what would be considered in Japan as left-leaning newspapers were gone. In terms of the social impacts at home, life did change for men, women, and children. For men, they were likely given either a red or white summons. A red summons conscripted them into the military, while a white summons conscripted them into industrial factories. For women, their initial role was primarily to contribute to the empire through childbirth and to quite literally breed the next generation of Japanese soldiers. Prime Minister General Tojo viewed the population difference between them and America as a bigger obstacle to overcome than their different industrial capabilities. Whereas the Western nations were quick to use women in the workforce to increase industrial output, Japan initially refused to do so. Tojo argued that to use women's labor outside the home would weaken the family system, which in turn would weaken the nation. As the war continued and it became apparent to Japan that America was replacing the carriers much more quickly than Japan was sinking them, and that the same couldn't actually be said about Japan, women started to appear much more quickly in the workforce. Children were, however, quickly placed in the factories. Summer holidays were replaced with labor training, and these training programs often had indoctrination exercises, such as playing darts with Churchill or Franklin Roosevelt's face as the board. Schooling was reduced to six hours per week, and by 1945, students as young as 10 were sent to work in the factories. Now, in regards to the economy, the first general mobilization law of 1938 gave the government complete control over industry and commodities. In 1939, the National Service Draft Ordinance secured the enlistment of 1.5 million Koreans to work in the Japanese mainland, mainly in coals and munitions factories. The conditions were extremely dangerous and 60,000 Koreans died as part of this industrial conscription drive. Despite their economic efforts, Japan just could not keep up with the manpower that the USA had. In 1943, they produced one fifth of the aircraft that America produced, and in 1945 alone, kamikaze attacks and their soldiers' orders to never surrender saw 7.4 million tons of shipping lost. This was made worse by Nimitz and MacArthur's advance, cutting them off from their newly acquired empire, meaning that they couldn't access their main coal, oil, rubber, and tin supplies. The conditions in the factories were far from good as well. 11-hour working days were the norm, and many Japanese lived on site. By the end of the war, the strict obedience of the soldiers was not matched by the workers. By 1945, there were high desertion rates and many cases of sabotage by the workers to try and bargain for better conditions. Rationing was also introduced as early as 1940, a year before Pearl Harbor, and it only began with sugar and matches. This was then extended out to gasoline, rice, and fresh produce, and within the first 15 months of the war, the Japanese economic police had arrested 2 million people. In rural Japan, 
Farmers would simply grow extra crops to supplement their rations, but for the urban Japanese, this was extremely tough and naturally a black market emerged. It was common practice for the buyer to pay a shopkeeper with non-monetary goods such as jewelry or a gift, or the buyer would happen to just drop their money on the floor on the way out from the store. It's hard to gain a specific number on how much was bought and sold on the black market, but an individualistic subculture did begin to emerge. Now, finally, the obvious last issue that the Japanese had to face at home was bombs. Now, I'm not just talking about the atomic bomb, but the strategic bombing campaigns in which industrial cities such as Itsuda were badly bombed in an effort to cripple Japanese industry. Other more major cities like Tokyo were also targeted with firebombing in which incendiary bombs were laid to break the will of the Japanese and turn them against their government. 80,000 to 130,000 civilians were killed in just Tokyo alone, and up to 1 million were made homeless. Come August, up to 200,000 Japanese would also lose their lives in the most famous bombing of all time. Thanks for watching. Do make sure to subscribe. This week in our History of Modern China series, we're looking at the origins of China's expansion into the South China Sea, and we can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.